So is Mary. Saturday. I got 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 I Seen the lady, I've seen the lady before. She's in a trailer. Which one is this? I need it. Is that what's going on? Thank you. Stay up there. Presentation. Oh. Thank you. Come on, open. There. This plant propagation is making sure. Yeah, I went to the the So right now I have 22 people in here. Okay, so I should start. 
Every time I come in here, it's different. It's different. Because someone else has been in here and messing with it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just take that. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to class. Tonight's <laughs> program is on plant propagation, seed starting, and anything to do with making more out of plants. And Kathy Shreve is our instructor tonight. She is an advanced master gardener, and she has been teaching plant propagation for me for at least 10 years. I can't years. even remember how long. <laughs> at least 10 years. And I think Kathy was in like the 20, 2004 class. I think it was actually like 2002. It was right after I moved here, which was in 2001, like okay. the next year after. Yeah. So she's been a master gardener for a long time. Mm -hmm. And she went through, she survived a, an advanced master gardener program also with me. So, oh, that was easy. <laughs> so, so today's class. I have I have stuff for you all to take home. Lots of stuff. We've lots got of lots stuff. of visual aids and stuff lots tonight. Stuff. So I have a, a variety of plant plant propagation cells, and they all have little plugs that come with them. So I'm going to go grab some water and hydrate a few of them. But these little plugs fit in there, and you put your seed in there, and so it's it's pretty easy to transplant them, up pot them. And Kathy will talk about up pot. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. I don't have. And we're going to do enough. some up potting because I actually have something ready. I don't always every year, but yeah, tonight. I <laughs> so I have, I have a lot of. Yeah, um, we're going to start some seeds and pot up some stuff. I, I was yep. just saying you were going to look for water, but I filled the water and get more water. Yep. Well, I have to have something that actually holds the water first. So no. Yeah, it's got to hold it in there. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll get some of these hydrated so you can see what these are all about. But I have all sorts of things for you to plant in, take stuff home. You got in. seeds. And I will look for some more of those mm -hmm. if they're not hiding someplace. Then all these seeds came from Susan Allen's store, the Hawthorne tree. So she's donated all these to them. Mm -hmm. So here's the deal with them. I want you to take as many as you want, and as much as you want, okay? <laughs> but all I'm asking is that you grow some for the Master Gardener plant sale. So keep some, donate some. So that's that's my only request on right. that. And then I've held some others back over here. And so the ones that need that are root crops and in your corn, they don't transplant. Or peas or beans. Yeah, they don't <laughs> transplant. Mm -hmm. So these ones, please take them and enjoy them. But Greg, plant them in your garden when the time comes. So there's mm -hmm. plenty there for everybody mm -hmm. to have. Plenty. Okay. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'm going to turn it and over. And if you would Kathy. like uh, suggestions on what's easier to grow, particularly in our kind of fickle climate, I'm happy to talk to you about that. All right, and please chime in with questions at any point during this presentation. Yep, and also for anyone who's from down south, likes okra. Yeah. <laughs> yes, difficult to grow here. But doable, you've got the one mm -hmm. hot soil. Mm -hmm. They got plenty of seeds up there. Mm -hmm. it, wants, it wants the soil hot. hot. So <laughs> don't plant too early. Yeah. It will sulk. I eat <laughs> not grow. <laughs> I don't usually plant it, direct sow it until like at least the middle of June or later. Yeah. So. Hot soil. Hot. Hot soil. So that's your black plastic. Yeah. Black plastic down there. Or black pots. I've had success with that. Yeah. Large black pots. <laughs> yeah. So there's flower seeds over here. There's a lot of herb seeds. There's, I, I still have stuff over here that doesn't like to transplant, but again, this is for you all to take and enjoy, grow, um, but donate some of it back to the plant sale. And I'll so, talk more about when the plant sale is in the presentation, because I'm going to give you homework. I'm mean that way. <laughs> So, that, Kathy, is your... All right. So plant propagation. Yes, you can, and we can help. That's what we do. All right. So it won't, won't go forward. Come on. 
There we go. All right. Why should you grow your own plants? After all, they have lots of them, like at Home Depot and Lowe's. You can just go buy them, right? Okay, the reasons you should grow your own is you can't find exactly what you want in the local stores. As you all may know, the growing climate in Wyoming is a bit difficult, and you might find lots of nice looking plants at Home Depot or Lowe's, but I can tell you right now, if you buy a hundred day to harvest tomato, you're probably not going to get any in our climate. And that's what they sell there. They pay no attention to climate. They just ship a bunch of plants here and there willy nilly. Or what you get can get from the local store is pretty sad looking. The people that are tending those plants are probably teenagers and this is their idea of watering. <laughs> and they get all wilty pretty quick because they don't know how to take care of them. Plants have gotten ever more expensive. And maybe you want a bunch of them, but your budget doesn't stretch that far. I can help you with that. You need a lot of plants. Maybe you just moved into a new house and you've got bare earth all around you and you need a bunch of plants to landscape with. Maybe your mother or aunt or grandmother has a favorite family plant that you want to make more of. I can help you with that. Maybe you want to grow your own pesticide-free produce. Do you realize that to be considered organic, your seedling has to be grown with organic methods? Do you think that the seedlings at Lowe's and Home Depot are grown organically? No. You want to involve your children or significant other in a nice, good, hearty outdoors project. Your lecturer has given you plant growing homework. What is a plant craze finicky master gardener to do? Grow your own. It's not that hard. It's what gardeners do. And you'll be the envy of all your gardening buddies. All right. So let's talk types of plant propagation. There are two main ones. Sexual. It's also called non-vegetative. Thick seeds. The offspring may not have the same characteristics as the parent. Just like when two people get together, the kid may like look like one or the other or both, or neither. Never know. <laughs> Milkman, yeah, who knows? <laughs> the other type is asexual or vegetative propagation. That's where the offspring are direct clones of the parent. Think cuttings, divisions, and layering. You're creating a clone of the mama plant. No funny business involved. All right, so I'm kind of a scientific nerdy person. I like to define what I'm talking about. So let's talk about seeds first, sexual propagation. What is a seed? A seed is a small, dormant, embryonic plant enclosed in a covering called the seed coat, usually with some stored food. So basically, it's a little tiny plant kind of origami into a little hard seed coat. So we're going to try to get that little plant to on origami, fold out, and grow. So how do you do that? Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to get the embryonic seed to break dormancy, pop out of the seed coat, and grow. So have you ever seen those sponges that are like really tiny and you put them in water and they fold out? That's basically what you're trying to get that little seed to do. All right. There are five things that every seed needs in order to get growing. Now, every seed may not need them in this exact order, but this is pretty, a pretty standard order. They need moisture. They need light at some point. I'll talk more about that later, what I mean by some point. They need a good germinating medium, soil, potting soil, something like that. Good air circulation and warmth. And we're going to talk about each of these things and why the seed needs it. Okay, let's talk about moisture first. That's always the first one, regardless of what kind of seed we're talking about. The process that jumpstarts seed growth is called imbibing. So when a seed imbibes, it takes up water. The seed coat softens, and like those little sponges, it starts folding outwards. <clears throat> And it pops out of that seed coat and begins growing. Most newly germinated plants that die are killed due to water-related issues, either too much or too little. 
A seedling needs just the right amount of water at the right time. And we'll talk more about how you do that. All right, let's talk about light. At some point, plants are gonna need light. Some seeds actually need darkness to germinate. And we'll talk about how you can determine which is which a little bit later. But plants produce their own food in a process called photosynthesis. And Catherine's probably talked to you about that. The plant uses water, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and sunlight to make food. A windowsill is hardly ever enough light to grow healthy, stocky seedlings. Just think when you're outside, how intense the sun is. When you're inside, is the sun ever that intense, even on a windowsill? Rarely. So I've seen this article where you can tell if your windowsill has enough light. When the bright sunlight is shining through your windowsill, put your hand over the windowsill. If you can see a clear defined shadow of your hand, you probably got enough light. If the shadow is non-existent or kind of faint, you don't have enough light. And if you don't have enough light, you're gonna grow leggy, spindly, not healthy, sickly seedling. We don't want that, do we? No. All right. You're gonna need some lights if your windowsill is not sufficient, which most of you won't have that. Oh, and we need to talk about e-glass too. If you have the light blocking, you know, the UV blocking glass, you're not gonna have enough light. Good for your electricity bill, not good for seedlings. All right. And you need to get those seedlings really close to the lights, one or two inches, if you can. Your system, whatever it is, needs to be flexible enough to accommodate the growing plants because as the plants grow, you have to move the lights up, right? Lights on chains work really well. My first seed growing setup, I was just getting started and I didn't want to grow that many seedlings. So what I did was the lights were fixed and I just moved the trays up by or down using a series of ever smaller boxes. But I only needed a few boxes, so that was fine. Now I grow tons of seedlings and that just ain't gonna do. I'm not gonna go around town hunting for all those boxes. <laughs> you don't need expensive, fancy grow lights. Shop fluorescent lights work perfectly fine. And we'll talk more about the type that you should really look for. What you should look out for is leggy, spindly seedlings. When you see that, that seedling is telling you, I need more light. It's always the result of not enough light. So let's look here, let's look at some examples. Yeah, these are healthy. Look at those nice, stocky, sturdy little seedlings. These are starting to stretch and you notice they're all going stretching the same way. Probably the light source is over here somewhere. So they're telling you I need more light. These in this tray, there's no hope for those. You're not gonna save those. When you see this stretching, it's called etoliation. When you see that, Seedlings are telling you, I need more light. What's lights? Is the blue and purple lights just as sufficient as the spectrum lights? Yes. And I've got, I started out, you'll see my seed growing set up in a minute. And I started out with just the shop fluorescent lights. But one day I was in Walmart and I found a bunch of LED fluorescent replacement bulbs for growing things, specifically grow lights. Now my basement looks like a disco because there are red, blue, and green lights, LED diodes in each one of those bulbs. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and they seem to work just as well. So, but I wouldn't have bought them full price because they were expensive. I got them like 80% off. So. When, once you get to know me, you'll know I tend to be very thrifty. So I'm going to show you how to take some shortcuts. And I will discuss which shortcuts not to take because I've already been there and done that. And that didn't work so hot. All right. Now let's talk about germinating medium. This is one of the shortcuts I tried to make early on. I'm like, well, I'll just get some dirt from my yard and grow them in that. Don't do that. That is not a good idea. The reason it isn't a good idea is the sterile mix won't harbor plant diseases, mushroom spores, or weed seeds. 
I don't want to be weeding my seedlings or pulling mushrooms out or go through all that work and have them die because they got some disease from my garden dirt. Seed starting mixes usually incorporate general, gentle fertilizers needed to coax little seedlings along without burning them. Little seedlings are like little babies. You wouldn't feed a newborn baby pizza, right? They need the right <laughs> diet. It's the same thing with little seedlings. All right. Seed starting mixtures are fine textured and light enough to allow even water penetration and prevent crusting, which prevents the little delicate seedlings from emerging. Don't want that. There are a number of commercial seed starting mixes available that are all just fine. Most reliable seed companies have their own formulas. Just make sure the one you choose is a sterile one. And it'll say it on the bag. I'm gonna show you the bag of my all time favorite seed starting mix. You might be surprised, nothing fancy. I've tried a number, it's the Dippy Natural Organic Seed Mix and you can get this at any big box store. They don't have good seedlings, but this is perfectly fine. So you can hand that around. And you can fill probably three or four of the bigger APS units, and we'll discuss more what these are in a little bit from one bag of that. So it does go quite a ways. <clears throat> All right, here's the results of using your own garden dirt and your own fertilizer. You get tons of mushrooms. You get fertilizer burnt seedlings if you put too much fertilizer on. And this is soil crusting. You see how hard those little seedlings are having to work to pop out there? You want to make it easy on them. You don't want them to have to work hard. All right, let's talk about warmth. Photosynthesis cannot take place under freezing temperatures. So you're going to have to provide something to keep your temperatures above freezing. Some plants like it really warm, like we always discussing with some of you in the elevator on the way up, peppers, particularly hot peppers and eggplant and watermelons and cantaloupes like it really hot. And it makes sense when you think about it because all those plants have either a tropical or middle Eastern origin. They're from places that are really hot. So it makes sense that they would like that. You can provide a gentle heat source using custom seedling heat mats or soil heating cables. I've also had people, I have not done this, but they say it works, get an old electric blanket, put it over the seed starting shelf or table or whatever they're using, cover that with plastic and turn it on low. I would advise caution because as all of you know, electricity and water do not mix. <clears throat> One of the things that I think beginning gardeners don't do enough of is look at seed germination guides, seed packet in the internet to determine what seeds need what. If you don't know, there's plenty of information out there. You can Google it you can look at the back of the seed packet. They will tell you what you need to grow that particular variety. So pay attention to that. If you decide to start perennials, particularly perennials that perform well in our climate, you might need to fertilize or stratify them. And that makes sense when you think about the conditions that these seeds grow in. The mother plant grows in the summer and in the fall drops seeds. Do those seeds start right away? Do they grow right away? No, because they know winter's coming. They know if they sprout right away, they're probably not going to make it through the winter. So most of these plants have some sort of chemical inhibitor in the seed coat that has to leach away through, you know, snow falling on them and melting, or maybe just time even would leach it away before those seeds can pop out and start to grow. So if you want to grow things like delphiniums and coneflowers and whatnot, you might need to vernalize them. Again, the seed packet will say you can do that yourself rather than waiting a whole winter by this method. You moisten a paper towel, you put your seeds in it, you fold the paper towel up and put that 
paper towel in a Ziploc bag. Now stick that in the crisper drawer of your freezer, not in the actual free, uh, refrigerator, not your freezer. You don't want to freeze them. You just want to get them cold. About once a week, take those bags out and unfold the paper towels and give it a look. Once you see the seeds starting to sprout, plant them because those seeds now think that they've gone through winter and they think it's spring and it's time to grow. So it's a way to trick them a little bit. Some seeds need more stratification than others. It can be up to three or four months for like hellbores. Those are notoriously difficult to grow from seed. <clears throat> I would recommend starting with easier stuff. So if I'm doing the post-gratification, I'm doing like the jug method. Mm -hmm. so the I winter bring, sewing, yes, you can do that. Mm -hmm. So I bring them in, right, at the 60 days or 30 days or whatever. To no. Pack of culture or wait till they start popping up? Wait till they start popping up. But you should have those in a place where they don't exactly freeze hard stuff, <laughs> like in a window well <laughs> or cuddled up next to your building, something like that, where they get a little extra warmth, just enough to keep them from totally hard freezing. Any other questions? So what she's talking about is a method where you can start your perennials the fall before. You plant them in a milk jug or something similar to this, close the lid, and then you put them outside, like in a window well, somewhere where they get a little protection, and then you just wait. And if you're successful, they'll pop up and start growing in spring for you. So that works too. <laughs> air circulation. You're going to need good air circulation. Now, you might not have thought of this one when you're talking about seed starting. The reason you want good air circulation is there's a disease, a fungal disease called damping off that can wreck your whole seed starting program. <clears throat> it strikes young seedlings. And what it does is the inner layer of the inside of the seedling or water moves up and down from the roots to the leaves becomes clogged. And the seedling can no longer move water efficiently through it. And it'll just keel over and die. Like it can take place in hours. You know, in the morning, your seedlings look great. You go back, check them in the afternoon, they're all wilted over. And once that happens, it's very hard to bring them back. So rather than thinking about bringing them back, let's think about preventing it. One of the things that helps prevent fungal diseases from taking hold is good air circulation. Fungus wants a warm, moist, still environment to thrive. Usually putting a small oscillating fan that's pointed at your seed starting apparatus is plenty. Another benefit of air, good air circulation, that oscillating fan, is it, it's kind of like Jane Fonda for plants. It moves the plants like this, you know, as the oscillating fan moves. So as that happens, your plant puts on more cells in the stem to stabilize itself. So it's kind of like Pilates or Jane Fonda for plants. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Just double checking. All right. <clears throat> you can also prevent uh, damping off disease by watering with a chamomile tea solution. And I found out this, uh, this little trick. A friend of mine who knows I'm a gardening nut found this like 1910 greenhouse growers book, like on how to produce things in greenhouses. That's way before they had any of the fancy antifungals that we have today. This was their antifungal water with chamomile tea. And I tried it and I'll be golly if it doesn't work. And it's cheap and it doesn't have any horrible chemicals in it. So now when I'm planting these uh, APS units, there's a water reservoir in here. I can get this out like that. I just put one or two chamomile tea bags in here. It makes the tea, automatically waters the plant. So the first year I tried this, I'm like, oh, they're full of hooey. That's not going to work. So basil is one of the plants that's really susceptible to damping off. So before I started using the chamomile tea, I would have to plant twice as many basil seeds as I actually wanted because I knew about half of them were going to die. That was just the deal. The deal. 
So the first year I did that, I put the chamomile tea in there thinking it's not going to work. Planted twice as many basil seeds as I usually do. And I'll be daggone if every one of those did not make a healthy plant. I had so many basil plants. <laughs> but now I know that it works. There's also some now organic products that uh, can work as well. One is called Actinovate. You can also Google that. And that I've used that too, and it works quite well, but it's pretty pricey. So chamomile tea is cheap. Again, the thrifty thing. <laughs> yes. Yep, I just let it run. Come on. There we go. This is showing you what a dampened off seedling looks like. See, it's just that part of the stem has collapsed because the back, the fungus has filled up the little channels that the water goes up and down the stem in and killed it. Here's a whole tray right here, right next to a healthy tray, this whole tray. Once you have it, that happen, you should get rid of that tray and sterilize that tray if you plan to use it again because you don't want the rest of your plants getting it. All right, one thing that many beginning gardeners do not do and they should do more of Look at the back of the seed tag. It tells you a lot of good stuff that you need to know. <clears throat> Here's one. I think this is peas. You notice on the when to start inside, it says not recommended. This plant does not like to be transplanted. So you should direct sow this. Special sowing and germination instructions. Soak seed in water for 12 to 24 hours before sowing. Because if you've ever seen dried up peas, they're pretty hard, right? I mean, they will rehydrate in the soil, but they're going to take a lot longer. You soak them before you plant them, you get off to a much quicker start. And over here, it tells you how deep to plant them. Good to know, right? There's a basic rule of thumb on seed depth where you should not plant seeds deeper than two to three times the widest part of the seed. So how big are most seeds? So you should just barely sprinkle some soil on them and pat it down. Most beginning gardeners plant them way too deep. So don't do that. Read your seed packets, it will tell you. Or it may say needs light to germinate, which means you don't cover it at all. You sprinkle it on the sur soil surface and kind of pat it in and go from there. Here's another one. This is a poppy. See, again, does not transplant well. And here it tells you recommended planting four to six weeks before average last frost. So that's how you know when to plant them. So it needs to get a little bit of cold on it to start well. Again, seeds require light to germinate. And here, seed days scatter and rake in lightly. What they mean is just scatter it and, you know, or take your rake and just barely scratch them in. Don't cover it. Right. Other practical considerations, unless you have a much better memory than me, trust me, all these little boogers, when they're small, they're pretty much alike. You're not going to remember unless you label them which was which. You might think you're planting lettuce when you're actually planting something entirely different. So make sure you label them. Popsicle sticks or commercial plant labels with a Sharpie works well. I like to use like the blue painter's tape because it sticks even in humid conditions and a Sharpie marker. Whatever method you choose works fine. Just don't use a regular ballpoint pen because I did that. That dissolved, and then I couldn't remember what was what. Don't do that. <laughs> so I didn't have a Sharpie marker, and I was too lazy to go by. Don't do that. <laughs> All right, plan ahead. I'm going to pot up some of these tonight. And I have some greenhouses, but it's still going to be pretty cold out there. It looks like it's going to get really cold again next week. So I'm gonna put these under the lights in the house. I have a seed starting set up in my basement. One of these will pot up to probably about four or five flats. By flats, I mean good. So you gotta plan ahead 
and not plant so many seeds that you can't accommodate the ones that are growing up, right? Got to think ahead. Bigger plants need more water. As they get bigger, you don't have to water them more frequently. When I'm watering them in the house, I put them in these closed trays like this. That means no holes in the bottom. And I put a capillary mat in there. So I can just water into the capillary mat and it soaks up into the little greenhouse that I've got going here. Or if I plant into these cells, see they have holes in the bottom. If I put them in there and make sure they're all flat, don't try to overcrowd it, they will cap capillary water up into them as well. They'll suck the water right out of that mat. <clears throat> but you gotta pay attention. It needs more water. All right, let's talk plant selection. Now, this is a lot of work. I'll admit it to start seeds inside and pot them up and harden them off and all that. So anytime I can get away not doing that, I will. So there are some plants that grow so fast, it makes no sense to start them early. Things like radishes, arugula, summer squash, beans, salad greens, green onions, turnips. They grow so fast, you don't need to do this business here. The only reason we're doing this business here is to get a jump start on the growing, on Wyoming short growing season. But like turnips, you get the right variety, you can direct sow it and have turnips in 30 days. And it likes cold weather. So why bother with that? <laughs> Some start so slow or grow so slow, you're better off with a one year old cutting or set or transplant. Things like asparagus, rhubarb, horseradish, rosemary, lavender, those are all very, very slow growers. So unless you're extremely patient, get bigger plants. Some plants do not like to be transplanted. Most of your root crops like carrots, beets, radishes, <clears throat> sweet peas, poppies. And it will say on there, like you saw in the poppy packet that we looked at earlier, it says, do not start indoors. All right. Does not like to be transplanted. Okay, we won't then. <clears throat> now, when you sow seeds, you need to dampen. When you open this bag, you'll notice this is very dry. So, when I'm filling up the seed starting units or oh, the homemade DIY mm -hmm. greenhouse here, you want to dampen the seed, the soil mix first. And we'll talk more about how to do that. I'm going to show you how and how to tell if it's wet enough or too wet. But just make sure that you dampen it first. <clears throat> now we talked about little teeny tiny seeds earlier. I'm going to show you some of them. These aren't that tiny. Somewhat tiny. Some things like lobelia are like dust, you know, so tiny. Just that there's no way that you pick up the seeds of those. So, what I do is I dampen a toothpick or a chopstick or a bamboo skewer, just dampen it. You don't want it soaking wet. You put a few seeds in either your hand or like a jar lid or something. And if you touch the dampened toothpick or skewer to the seeds, a few will stick. And then I just transfer them to the cell or the greenhouse spray or whatever, by wiping them off and repeat. That way you can get just a few seeds in each one without, you know, 10, all 100 in that one, none in that one. <laughs> I would use a new toothpick for every different variety you plant or make sure it's really cleaned off because otherwise you might think you're planting lobelia when you're actually planting petunias or vice versa because some of them might stick and you might not be aware. <laughs> Seed covering, we already talked about like this, but it bears talking again because this is one of the biggest mistakes that I see new gardeners make. 
Generally, seeds should be covered two, no more than two to three times the widest part of the seed. So that means the bigger the seed, the deeper you should plant it, right? Generally speaking, that's true. But again, what do you do? There you go. It may say don't cover, like you saw on some of them. And I struggled with this at the beginning because I wanted to get an even very thin cover of soil over my seed, you know, because you know, maybe I only need to cover an eighth of an inch. That's a very small amount. But I already dampened this soil. So I was trying to use the dampened soil to cover the seeds and it would go blob, blob, blob. So I finally figured out reserve some dry soil and sprinkle that on, pat it down, and then moisten it with a spray bottle, which is what we're going to do. And the other thing that you should always do is tamp down your seeds. You want really good seed soil contact because the seed's going to be pulling water out of the soil. And if it's not in very good contact with the soil, it's going to have trouble with that. So you can use a specialized object, whatever, that fits into these, or you can just use your hands. That's what I tend to do because they're handy. <laughs> I, I just make sure to clean and dust off my hands between planting different things. <clears throat> All right, that's a lot of stuff, right? I gave you a lot, whole lot of information right there. And you're probably thinking, how on earth am I going to do all this? It's just too much stuff. Well, APS units to the rescue. When I found these, these are the most, as far as I'm concerned, the most wonderful invention on the planet. There's a water reservoir in here. You fill up that reservoir, put in your chamomile tea bag so you're getting fungal control. This peg stand goes in the water. There's a capillary mat. I didn't bring the capillary mat, but anyway, there's a capillary mat that goes through these slots and hangs down into the water and sucks the water up to the food rooms. So then, you fill these little cells with soil, tamp it down so you make a nice plug in there. Plant your seeds, cover them or not, as the seed packet says. Put the lid on and stick the whole thing under your grow lights and you're gold. I grow almost everything using the PSD. They work great. All right, there's several different kinds. This one I got from a company called Lee Valley. They're all online companies. I don't know of anybody that sells these here in town. This is a Lee Valley one and this styrofoam one. Then I also found, <clears throat> a hard plastic one. Cause these are kind of fragile, right? Particularly as they get older. Like you can see on this one, the little slots for the capillary mat have broken off. It still works fine. It doesn't look very pretty. You can hand that around. Feel free to take it apart and look at all the different parts. Here's a hard plastic one. This is from Gardener Supply. So every year, once you're done growing all your seedlings, you have to sterilize these and scrub all the dirt out. I have to be very careful with these. I can't scrub too vigorously because it's a styrofoam. And it's probably 12 year old styrofoam, <laughs> so it's kind of fragile. These are much dirtier. You can even put these in your dishwasher if you don't mind getting a bunch of dirt in your dishwasher. How about the horrible? I don't know where Catherine got those. You have to ask. I have a few. Okay, you can hand those around. Now, <clears throat> There are many different kinds of APSs, but they all have one thing in common. They take all the guesswork out of seed starting. Like I used to travel a lot for work, not so much anymore. This reservoir will hold enough water for about a week. So I could leave these, you know, I would put my lights on a timer. So I have to be there to turn them on and off. I'd fill up all the reservoirs and I could go off for a week and come back and they weren't all dead. Because I do have a roommate, but he is so not a gardening person. <laughs> so not a gardening person. <clears throat> they take all the guesswork out by providing consistent moisture. And then we talked about that. 
They keep the baby plant warm, baby plants warm, and they provide very stable climactic conditions. No big swings in temperature, moisture, all that, which is what baby plants need. All right, we talked about how to do all that. So unless you got questions, I'm not going to. Well, you take that off as soon as the seeds are going to sprout. Okay. You cover that. So that was a good question. Have you run into an issue with the root screen with the capillary mat? Yes. If I can't get to, well, the capillary mat's not such a big problem because I can pull them out. But I have been delayed sometimes, like when my mother died, that the roots grew through the styrofoam. So another bonus for the hard plastic. <laughs> so to save those trays, what I did was I took some silicone caulk and I caulked the bottom to plug up the holes. Because those are about 35 bucks each, and my thrifty self just could not stand to throw them away. All right. This year, I had an epiphany. I saw this on the internet. This is a DIY APS unit. This is a clamshell. I think what came in here, I don't know, something, some kind of edible vegetable, fruit, something. And what I did was I poked holes in the bottom put my dirt in there, my potting soil, put the lid on, put it in this tray because I have plenty of these capillary mats and you can buy this, you know, by the yard and cut it to whatever size shape you want. And that has worked splendidly. So I may never buy another APS unit again. Or you can pass that around and have a look. If you pick up this tray, though, pick it up with both hands because it's got a crack corner on it. Is this just built? It's um, that really heavy interfacing stuff okay. that people put in clothes. Okay. So it's for the fabric store and bought that. <laughs> so you pretty much plant them up the same way. And it, um, those, if I don't want to wash them and sterilize them, I don't have to do all that jazz because I'll just get more of them, you know? You could also use like the containers that rotisserie chickens come in. And to poke holes in it, I have this old, uh, it's a kitchen utensil, like you use to turn steaks and stuff with, really old, that I picked up from the uh, thrift store for like a quarter, and I just heat the tongs and melt holes through there. All right, now as your babies get bigger, you're going to have to move the lights up or the plants down, one or the other, however you want to do it. You need to maintain the top of the plants one to one and a half, maybe two inches from the lights as best you can. So having the lights on the chains is good because say this tray grows fast and the ones over on this end don't grow so fast, you can make the light go like this. <laughs> However you gotta do it. <laughs> okay. Now all you gotta do is remember to keep them water. If you're using these, keep the reservoir full. If you're using the other one, just keep that mat wet. Remove the clear plastic covers once the seeds get sprouted well, because you don't want them to be too wet all the time. So you start having issues if you do that. All right, our plants are growing up. They're getting big. Now what? They can't stay in that APS unit or that veggie clam shell forever. We need to move them out of the APS into their first starter home or pot them up. How do you know when it's time to pot them up? On bigger plants, you want to wait until they have two to four true leaves. So the first leaves you leaves, I'm doing this because they're not really leaves, that you see on a seedling are not really leaves. Those are the cotyledons. Those are the stored food that was present in the seed when the seed popped out of the seed coat. And you can tell the difference because they don't really have veins in them. See, when you compare this one to this one, see the nice veins here? You don't see veins here. So that's got two good true leaves, so it can be potted up. Sometimes if I'm growing something like lobelia, when it sprouts, it looks like moss. It is so tiny. And I usually just wait until I can actually handle it without crushing it. <clears throat> what should the new home be? Well, these work really well. 
That works good. You work good. Pots. I'm very thrifty, as I said. These to buy new are kind of expensive. So what I do is a lot of uh, greenhouses have these pot bins, and they're fine with you going in there and recycling anything. You can just take it home, you need to clean it and bleach it. Remember, you don't know if the plants that were in these pots have any diseases or not. You don't want to bring those home. So you should soak it in a 10% bleach solution. And I usually give it a flick or two with a scrubby brush. I have several, you know, smaller ones for these, bigger ones for these. You can bleach it, disinfect it. But those are perfectly fine. In this case, a styrofoam coffee cup. You can poke some holes in the bottom of the pencil. That works fine. Yogurt containers, cottage cheese containers. Again, you can melt holes in them with your, you know, your metal implement. Those will all work fine. So you don't have to spend a lot of money. You just have to be creative. You don't want it to be too big, like to plant one of those little lettuce plants. And this would kind of be a waste of potting soil, right? Maybe that, or maybe this. So you have to keep in mind what you're planting up and what size the container. Like for tomatoes, because they grow so fast, I go ahead and pot them up in this because in two weeks, they will have roots filling that. So I don't want to pot them up every week. <laughs> All right, make sure it has drainage holes. Is appropriate size and is, is clean, has been disinfected if necessary. If you buy new pots, you don't have to disinfect. All right. Use regular potting soil, which is cheaper. You don't have to use a seed starting soil, which is a little bit more expensive. Let's show you something. Master Gardener sells a very good brand of potting soil. I forget what it's called, but it's a good brand. It's not just for the I'm getting older, things. Sometimes just leave my head and come back whenever they want. I'm sure none of you have that problem. But this is, this is one of my favorite plants of potting soil. This is Pro Mix. And last I knew, Menard had it. This is one of my favorite plants. So, two sides and ciders are still pretty low. So they're not I'm fungus sorry? Snacks. Are those still the same yeah. low? So they don't have fungus snacks? Right. I bought that last year, but it hasn't been open, so it should be fine. What you can run into issues with is what she's saying. If you have a half of a bag of potting soil from the year before, I would not use that in this inside growing operation because it probably harbors fungus gnats. Brand new, open, it's fine. Or unopened like that one is fine. Well, this is dirty one year. <laughs> yeah. And I know it's very popular, but what's that brand? I can't even think of it. It's the big popular brand that everybody sells. Miracle, Miracle Grow. Do not buy that. <laughs> Do not buy that. <laughs> it's horrible. That picture you saw earlier with the mushrooms? Remember the mushroom picture? That was Miracle Grow. So, I don't know what they make that out of, but and it has way too much fertilizer in it. Those fertilizer burn seedlings, miracle grow. Don't buy that. All right. So plant the plant at the same level in the soil, not deeper, not higher. Not deeper, not higher. There we go. <laughs> As it was growing in the APS, label it, water it, put it in the tray. Stick it under the lights or put it in the greenhouse. Don't fertilize yet. It's not ready for fertilizer. You just stressed it out by transplanting it and putting fertilizer will be too much at this point in time. Wait about two to four weeks after you transplant something to begin fertilizing. And I never ever fertilize at more than a third of what the, the directions say. I never, because it's like cutting hair. You can always put more. But if you put too much, you can't take it out. <laughs> All right. Here we talk about the right bulbs. 
So you can now get, like I said, LED grow lights, which are perfectly good, but a bit expensive. Maybe you'll make a splurge if you find them on sale like I did. For the fluorescent, you should look for daylight fluorescent, or if it's got it on the pox, um, 5 to 6,500 Kelvin bulbs. A Kelvin is a measure of luminosity. So that's what you should look for. It doesn't always say it on the box, but if it says it, that's what you should look for. <clears throat> All right, here's my indoor growing setup. It's some plywood shelves that I varnish, so in case I get water on them, and you will get water on them, trust me on this, so the water doesn't soak in and warp them. And I've got them on chains. They're in the basement, so it's dark. You don't need windows to grow seedlings. You just need a lot of grow lights or fluorescent lights. They're on chains, so I can move them up and down. I've got three shells. It doesn't take much space, but I can grow like more than a dozen APS units on there. So I can get a lot of seedlings in there. And when I'm not growing stuff, I store my seeds growing stuff on there like you see over here. So that doesn't take up any more room. When I very first got started, I used some under counter like you use in a kitchen, fluorescent lights that are about yay long, and a metal shoe rack. And I just wired the lights up under the bottom of the rack with twist ties. And then I use boxes to move my APS units up and down. So you can get creative. There's all kinds of things you can do out there. Just depends on how much you wanna spend and how creative you can get. All right, our little family keeps growing. They've outgrown the basement. Now they need to move out into the suburbs. So what do you do? There are these little four-tier pop-up mini greenhouses that are inexpensive and work quite well. To keep those warm, what I discovered is if you get the old K9 Christmas lights, not the LED ones, the ones with the bulbs you actually have to screw in that get hot, one string of those lights will keep your little greenhouse warm even on the coldest night. They put off a lot of heat. But you gotta be careful and wire them in so that the bulbs do not touch either the plants or the plastic cover, because it will A, burn the plant and melt the hole through the cover. So be very careful. <laughs> if it gets really, really exceptionally cold, what you can do is throw an old blanket over this whole setup and it'll keep it toasty warm in there. I would suggest that you weigh this down somehow because you know what happens in Wyoming winds. What I did was I put some pavers on this bottom shelf and I had it next to my garden fence, so I bungeed it to the fence, so it didn't go anywhere. And you have to be careful when watering in this setup with the Christmas tree light, so I just pulled each shelf out and watered it with a watering can. Because again, electricity and water do not mix. <clears throat> All right, so I also, to make sure it wasn't going to freeze or get too hot because contrary to popular belief, the biggest problem you're going to have is not your plants freezing, you're going to fry them. So I put a remote thermometer in there, it has like a little remote sensor and you can put the station in your house so you can look at that without having to trudge out there and see what the temperature is so you keep an eye on it. Even on the coldest day, when it's very sunny, you're going to have to vent this because it's going to get too hot in there. You're going to boil your plants. So I would just open like one side of that zippered cover and clamp it with some office clamps to keep it open so it wouldn't, wouldn't boil. And here's an action shot on a cold night. See how warm that is in there? It condensed a bunch of water on the cover. And even then, I had to open it. So. Temperature would be like. So it depends on what you're growing. If you're growing coal crops, you can keep it around 40 to 50 degrees. If you're growing things that need it warmer, like melons, tomatoes, okra, peppers, particularly hot peppers, eggplants, they need it above 60. I'm sorry. Above 60. So what I usually do is I start the stuff that likes it cold first. I start things kind of in waves. I start all the cold season crops first, get those all planted out, and then I start the hot seasons, warm season stuff. 
So you don't have to plant it all at once. You know, you can just kind of keep it rolling because as soon as the ground is thawed enough that you can dig it, you can plant things like cabbages, broccoli, cauliflower, onions, all those cold peas, all those cold season crops. You just have to harden them off before you put them outside. We're going to talk about that too. How long did you say for the warm season? 60. All right, if you don't want to spend the money for that pop-up greenhouse, you can make your own. All you need is a cheap plastic shell, some cheap plastic spring plants, a bit of half-inch PVC, a pl big plastic bag from like a mattress or something, four hose clamps, and you're in business. There's a way around it. I'm going to find it. <laughs> Well, there you go. You can do that. And it works just the same as the pop-up one. Other points. Um, exposure. The east side of your house is ideal. Like I said, those are going to get hot fast in the sun. So a little afternoon shade, you know, like in an area that's lightly shaded in the afternoon will be good. You want to protect it from the wind and secure from the wind because otherwise it's going to blow away. You will fry before you freeze. So you will boil those plants before you freeze them. So what I would normally do, because I have a regular nine to five job, is I would look at the weather. Okay, it's going to be sunny today. So when I left for work, I would zip up the cover and clamp it and give it some ventilation. And then when I come home, I would zip it back down. And it worked fine. I would set it up on a weekend with no plants in it, but with the thermometer in it. So you can just see how it reacts to your situation and if it get does get really cold like we do sometimes you can cover it with sheets a row cover an old blanket to keep it warm or if it's really getting too hot you can cover it with a sheet or some row cover to give it a little shade in the afternoon okay you can plant your shade loving plants, put those on the lower shelves. Like if you want to grow things like begonias and impatiens that like shade. I would rotate the sun loving plants because you notice it's got several different shelves there. Like about every other day, I would swap the second shelf one with the top shelf one and vice versa. Watch for pests. I know that in my greenhouse, I'm going to get aphids. It happens every year. So before I start getting aphids, I start spraying with either neem oil, which is an organic pest control, which you can buy at any big box store, or I um, can't remember the name of it now. It's a four-in-one spray, and it's mostly made out of sesame oil. And it just, when you spray it, it suffocates them. So spray with that. I just go out there like every Sunday afternoon. My job is to go out and spray all the plants in the greenhouse with either neem or the form one spray. If you see a plant that has a disease or some horrible insect that you can't kill without using methyl ethyl death, you need to remove it. Don't try to save it. Just remove it. Plant a few extra because you will lose a few. All right, now the next thing we need to do before we plant about in the garden is to harden them off. Because all this time you've been treating them so nice, they think they're in Hawaii or Panama or somewhere. They don't know that they're in Wyoming. So you have to gently introduce them to the idea that they're in Wyoming. So to do that, you take them outside on a sunny but not too cold, not too hot day and leave them for like an hour. Then you put them back in the greenhouse. The next day you do the same thing, but maybe for two hours and so on and so forth until they're staying outside all day without any, you know, injury. Because if you take a plant that's been growing in a greenhouse and stick it directly out in your garden on a sunny day, it will sunburn. Just like putting an Irishman on the beach in Cuba or somewhere. <laughs> 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 they need, you know, gentle introduction. So we're trying to introduce them to the fact that they're now in a place that has a lot of temperature fluctuation, a lot of wind and intense sun. So they can develop that tolerance, but you got to build them up to it. You can't just dump it on them all at once. 
<clears throat> and here's how you do it. Uh, we already talked about that. Once you've hardened them off, feel free to plant them in your garden. All right, the next part we're going to talk about asexual reproduction. Let's now a good time for a break if somebody needs a restroom break or whatever. Come back in about 10 minutes and we'll talk about that. And you can ask me any questions during the break. Those girls from the shiny? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a good picture because they're clones. That's very much shiny. Yeah. Found those in Sam's last year. Yep, those work fine. Yep, mm -hmm. 5,000 Kelvin and 5,000 lumen. Yeah, we're good. Well, in business. They work great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep, those are fine. Well, that my husband yelled at me because another one showed up on my doorstep today. But it was the four shelves. So then I can harden them off in that. So, you know, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, then he's like, Oh, wait, it was in the grow lights. So, like, okay, go buy them. My roommate, he's always like, you buy so many plants, and this is it. I go, I don't spend money on alcohol. I don't live. Menards. So, we found some at Menards. Yeah, 5,000 women, 5,000. And they're LED. Yep. And you can, and you can string 10 of them together. Yeah. There's this guy selling some grow lights online, and we just had to look up the yeah. run cost before, mm -hmm. and it would have cost, they say, like some of the really quiet dollars for 16 hours, and I'm like, and some of them are quite energy hoggy. That's why I recommend either the fluorescents or the LED. Yeah. It's a lot more energy. So I have a lot of house plants, so I have like the pink for lights for like the dark corners for my mm -hmm. house plants. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's relatively cheap, but I'm like, on the um, garden side, the house plant side, there's always people mm -hmm. trying to sell off their root lights and don't want any more for like five, ten bucks. Works fine. Like my roommates always like, you buy so many plants, so many plants, so many things. Like that. I'm like, well, I don't gamble. I don't drink. Right. I don't even really drink coffee. I don't buy a lot of shoes. Like I've spent it on something. <laughs> Does garden to share all the love to? <laughs> Some kind of bad habit. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what all do you grow normally? Everything. <laughs> Everything that you grow here. Do you take it to the farmer's market or how do you? No, um, you know, I have in freeze a lot of it. Oh. And then I have a business where I sell uh, pickles, sauerkraut, oh. salsa, yeah. jelly, yeah. all this stuff. Yeah. It's exciting. Where do you do that? Well, I'm in the process of moving. I bought another house in Cheyenne. So once I get moved over there, I'll be at 4002 Rock Spring Street. Oh, that's a good house. Yeah. That's the new house. So it doesn't yeah. the money yet. Yeah. But I like it that way. To figure out how to do this. Like you said, if you want to be gone for a peach. <laughs> well, these are great for that. Really great for that. I don't know. Once they get out into the greenhouse, they're going to need water almost every day. Yeah. So, how do you love? Uh, I always worry about they storm with the water on it. I mean, I know there's stuff like that. Yeah, I'm not a gardener, but I've gotten trained where he can water stuff. Thanks for being here. No, I enjoy this class. What do you learn as an advanced master gardener? Catherine's not teaching us now. You learn a lot more about how everything works together. All kinds of plant and how they do stuff. Yeah, 
I'll move these into something like this. Because you grow oh, that, oh, into that. Yes, you can. Yes. So, oh, so you, you can get this directly right. right. Yeah. 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 I actually turned my powder.
And then sneaking them around the back so the manager has an arm Because, you know, a lot of them, I live in a senior building, mm -hmm. and a lot of them have said they'd like to do that. Yeah. Why not? So, I already work in the grounds because I just, I have to play in dirt. It's yeah. me in spring comes. I want one of everything out of them. Yeah, I kind of have that problem too. The maintenance guy sent me to the store to replace some roses. Mm -hmm. So I took a picture of all these plants and I said, I want them all. <laughs> now, these are the ones that we used to do and they go. I was thinking about this today, so I lost my yeah, there's there's a special technique for what I understand. <laughs> Okay, let's start to get back to the seats, people. Yeah, that'll be. Mix it in with enough other yeah. You don't know, and enough salad dressing. <laughs> All about the salad dressing. Mm -hmm. All right, we can look at the seeds later. <laughs> I know it's hard to break a will. Yes. <laughs> Especially when they tell you you can have them more stick. Maybe if I pop them with this towel. All right. A little more light. I know it's hard to get away from the seeds. All right, so the next method we're going to talk about is asexual reproduction. That's where all the baby plants are going to be clones of the mom. All right, there's lots of different ways to do that. You can layer, you can use cuttings, you can do divisions, and we're going to talk about all of those. But let's talk about layering. Layering is where a plant automatically makes roots wherever it touches the ground. Some well-known examples of that are land's ears and strawberries. They do it. You don't have to help them. They just do it. 
But there are some other plants that if you give them a little help, they will layer. So what you do to layer is you bend a branch down to the soil. You make a wound on the bottom part of the where it's going to touch the ground or be buried. You bury the section, you weigh pin it or pin it down. And generally, depending on the plant, you'll get new roots forming in nine to 12 months. Not a fast method, but you know, if you've already got that plant, why not try it? I discovered because I put too much mulch around my clematis, that clematis will do that. So. To increase your layering success, you make a little cut on the bottom. You can prop it open with a toothpick or a matchstick. You wanna prop that cut open because where the roots form is on that inner cambium layer. You know, when you cut a stem or a woody stem, you see like a green halo right past the actual bark. That's where the roots come from. So if you can expose that to the soil for a prolonged period, your chances of success go up. If you add a little rooting hormone to that cut, you'll even get more success, something like rootone. Or you can make your own natural rooting hormone by soaking a bunch of willow branches in some water. If you've ever tried to root willow, you'll know that it's extremely easy because it's got a high concentration of those hormones that form roots. So just chop up a bunch of pieces of willow, soak it in a bucket, and you've got a bucket of natural rooting hormone. Once you get good roots forming, and you can test that by kind of giving a gentle tug on the tip of the plant that's sticking back out of the soil, and if it won't move, you got good roots, you know, take the pin off and do that. <laughs> Once it won't move, you've got good roots, and you can sever the baby from the mom, and you got a whole new plant. And you can transplant baby to its new home. There are several ways to do that. You can tip layer, which is burying the tips. A simple layer, like the one we saw earlier, you can do a trench layer where you layer, you know, make a number of cuts and bury the whole thing. Let's see. You can do a serpentine layer, you get fancy with a flexible stem and make it go up and down and get a bunch of plants. You can mound layer where you make wounds on the stems, you know, close to the, the main stem and put mulch over the whole thing, kind of like I did with my clematis, unintended. Or you can air layer where you put some potting soil on an air cut, you know, like above, way above the ground level. Like maybe you can't bend the stems down far enough. So you can make a wound on a stem up here, pack some potting soil around it, wrap it with saran wrap, put some rubber bands on it and wait. Cuttings, and if you have house plants, you've probably already done cuttings. Like this is an African violet, one of the most easy things to root from a leaf. <clears throat> Many plants will root from just a section of the plant, a leaf, stem, a cane, a root. So you can root them in water, but you'll probably have better success if you put them in potting soil. And these APS units are also the bomb for rooting cuttings because it keeps it moist the whole time, right? So you can put a cutting in each cell instead of seeds and you're off to the races. It's especially handy if you wanna grow things like rosemary and lavender that take forever to grow from seed. And even if you're the best gardener or horticulturist in the world, if you get 10% germination from rosemary or lavender seeds, you're doing good. They do not germinate well. It's not you, it's just the nature of the plant. So you'll be much more successful if you just buy one and take cuttings. All right, types of cuttings. Softwood cuttings, which is what you would be doing if you were growing lavender cuttings. You want to cut the soft, flexible green stems for those type of cuttings. Semi-ripe is you take it a little later in the summer, like maybe July, August, where the stem is no longer green, but it's still pretty flexible. Hardwood cuttings are like for grapes or apples or something. You take those in the winter when the plant is dormant and the stem is fully, I call it barked up. It's got kind of a quirky bark on it. 
So how do you know which plant to take that with? Google is a great resource. You say, how do I take grape cuttings? And it will give you all the directions for apple cuttings or whatever. I love Google. My whole Google search thing is just full of plant searches. Again, the uh, rooting hormones can help greatly with your success. Rootinone, Hormix, your willow water, whatever you want to use. Again, you got different types of cuttings. There's tip cuttings where you just cut off the end of the branch. Basil cuttings where you cut off a side branch. Keel and mallet, and I have a picture of that. It's a side branch plus a part of the main stem. Stem sections, many root uh, cane producing plants like sugar cane, they grow all sugar cane with stem sections. They save a number of the sugar canes and they plant them in trenches and everywhere there's a node, a new plant comes up. You can do it with a different bakia too, that kind of house plant with a kind of bamboo looking stem. Root sections, you dig up pieces of the root. That's very common with clematis. They take root cuttings. And leaf cuttings like African violets or begonies. So here's some pictures. Here's your mallet cutting. It's a side branch plus a section of the main stem. And roots are going to form at each end. And this cutting will take off and be the main stem. A heel cutting, kind of the same thing, but you just need a small piece of the main stem. Here they wounded this to get, they're trying to expose that green cambium layer again, because again, that's where your roots are going to form. Here's root cuttings from a clematis. They just dug up, you know, on the side a little bit and cut off some roots and they're going to plant those. The thing about root cuttings is I like to make a different cut on the bottom and top. By that, I mean, like, say, here's your root. Here's my root growing down this way, right? So on this section, I'll cut it flat, but then when I get to this part, I'll take a diagonal cut and then I'll cut flat and then diagonal again. That's because on a root, once you've pulled it up out of the ground, it can be hard to tell which was up and which was down. And if you plant it like this, <laughs> it ain't gonna grow. <laughs> here's a basil cutting where they just take a side shoot and here's the Diffenbachia stem cutting. No, I just dug a little bit on the side and cut some side roots. I just barred a few roots and left the mama plant alone. All right, division. That's exactly like what it sounds. You just dig up the plant, a big, healthy, mature plant, break it into pieces and plant all the pieces. Very common to do with daylilies, irises grasses, anything with a fibrous root or a rhizome like an iris. You don't want to do it on things that have a tap root, like milkweed does not divide well because it's got a big long tap root. Sometimes you have to do this or your plants get really overgrown and quit blooming like iris. If you don't divide them periodically, it quits blooming because it's just so congested in there. Again, what kind of plant should you divide? Something with a fibrous root or a suckering plant with runners, like hen and chicks is a very good plant to divide. Here's the main mama plant. It's got all these little babies around it. You can break off all those little babies and replant them and you'll get new hen and chicks. Don't try to divide plants with a taproot. My hen and chicks, they're like sheep of the sticks, right? <laughs> it's blooming. It's blooming. And once it blooms, the mama plant dies. That's her last hurrah. <laughs> yep, mm -hmm. they will do that. When they get mature enough, they bloom and then they die. The other plants that do that are yuccas, agaves, certain cacti. Here's the vision. That's an iris. You can see their they dug up the rhizome and they're dividing it in pieces. You want each piece to have some of the green leaves on it. And when you plant iris, you want the back, the top of this rhizome exposed. So like my mom always said, they want their backs in the sun. Here's one where they got like a really thick 
tough tangle of stuff they're trying to divide and they got two pitchforks and they pull it apart. Like that would work well for most grasses. A big clump of grass would work well. Here, this is I think a daylily and they're just pulling the sections apart and planting. You just wanna make sure each section has a good amount of roots and a good amount of green leafy growth. Pastas work well. Pastas, yep. Mm -hmm. Lots of plants are easy to divide. Here's one, that's an agave. It's put on pups. That's what they call all these little plants. So they remove the pups from the mom. And you can trim the roots up to about a third if you need, if you want to put it in a pot. And it's just got this big long root that won't fit in the pot. You can trim the roots up to a third when you plant it, replant it. That's fine. <clears throat> Water and sh provide shade to your new up-potted plants because they've just had a terrible shock. You root you know, broken up their happy home and they're sulking. So make it easy on them. You have better luck on your divisions if you do it in spring and fall when it's cool, when it's cloudy, you'll have much better success than in July when it's blazing hot. I mean, you could still do it. You're just gonna have to water the crap out of them. <laughs> I'm being realistic, you will. You can water, you can water them to death. Also, I like to do it either in the evening or early morning. It gives them a better chance. All right, take home lessons. Enjoy, experiment, expect to fail and learn. I will tell you, even the best horticulturist kills plants. We're just better at hiding. <laughs> <laughs> I just look at a failed plant as an opportunity to try something else. So don't worry about it. You're going to kill stuff. Get over it. All right, here's some of my favorite resources. I, I can leave the screen up if you'd like to write down some of these. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I'm going to head up the slide. I'm going to give them to Catherine so she can post them. So you don't have to write it down. Uh, with the vision, would you ideally replant that if you were potting on basically the soil you dig up or would you put it I would like make a combination of potting soil and the soil I dug up because it's usually not enough of the soil you dug up for all the plants you know like I dig up a clump of daylilies I divide it into eight well I got some dirt here but I need more dirt so I usually mix it up here's the other thing about using garden soil if you fill up a gallon pot with garden soil it's going to be very heavy and I'm getting older. I prefer things not to be so heavy. <laughs> yeah. So does anybody want me to leave this up longer? Okay. I'll leave it up as long as you want. We got time. Like I said, Google is great. I Google almost everything now. So one of the things while she's writing, one of the tricks I'll do is like, I've got this seed packet and I'm gonna plant some of these. I'll write on the front of it, like I'll put a piece of the blue tape on here. I'll write on here, cover one eighth inch, cold. You know, that tells me it needs cold, how deep to plant it. Because a lot of times I don't have my glasses on out in the garden. I can't read this. <laughs> And I'll even write on there how many I want to plant because I might not want to plant the whole thing. A lot of seeds are perfectly good the next year. There are a few notable exceptions like delphiniums. You want fresh delphinium seed. It doesn't hold well, but most will hold two, three, four years. So if you just want to plant half a packet of tomatoes, that's fine. The other half will be good next year. Good? Not yet? <laughs> and you'll see a lot of these ads like where they say oh put banana peels in your garden or you water your plants with mouthwash I'm like that doesn't happen in nature so I don't know why I would do that <laughs> here's one tip that you often see in gardening books they tell you to put wood ashes in your garden. Do not do that here. They do it back east because their soils are acidic and wood ashes are alkaline. Our soils are already 
pretty alkaline. So if you do that, you can ruin your soil. So don't do that. Don't put that. Okay. All right. One more. This is one of my very favorite. If I can't find it on Google, I go to this book on how to propagate something. And it's got everything. Because some on some of the more obscure like native plants, it's hard to find a reference. And it's in there. And there are sources that sell used books. Again, <laughs> all the money I save, I can buy more seeds, right? <laughs> okay. All right, you got homework. I would like you to grow at least one flat of something for the plant sale. Two or five or 10 would be better. It does not have to be from seed. If, for instance, you have a lot of irises and you want to dig them up and divide them, that's great. Do that. Baileys, whatever. Or you've got a bunch of columbine seedlings in your yard and you want to dig them up, pot them up. Do that. Whatever it is. Almost everything sells well at the plant sale. If you don't have a good space to grow stuff, but you've got a lot of house plants, those sell well too. Start rooting some African violets or that ivy stuff that grows like wildfire or wandering Jew or whatever, it'll sell. <laughs> okay, this year's plant sale is going to be out at Archer on May 6th. So if we're growing for the plant sale, are we going to start these as if we were going to really put them out in the garden or are we going to start them as if we want them to be good and ready to go? It depends. Good <laughs> <laughs> I grow so much stuff, I have this handy dandy Excel sheet, which I'll spread it around. So the things you see highlighted in yellow are the things I'm gonna grow for the plant sale. On some of these, I'm also gonna grow some for me. So there's two lines on here with different start dates. So <clears throat> for the days of transplant, where should you look? Yes, I'm gonna keep waving this around. <laughs> So you can take a look at this and I can send this to Catherine if you would like to plagiarize it, I'm fine with you doing that because it has yeah. some formulas in there that count days for you. Yeah, I'll go hand that around. Yeah. For permission to plagiarize. <laughs> All right, plant sale, what to bring? As many healthy plants as you can share. Seed grown division starts out of your garden or House plants, whatever, what not to bring, too young, too leggy, diseased or infested. If you wouldn't buy them at a plant store, don't bring them. Here's some examples, way too leggy and too young. These are beans, I think. Infested, don't bring that. <laughs> These are examples of what people brought. <laughs> Oh, don't be that person. <laughs> All right. Now, what we're going to do next is I'm going to take groups of like five or six of you over here, and we're going to go through planting up some APS units, up potting, so on and so forth. The rest of you, get to do this wonderful self quiz. So. Do we just talk amongst ourselves or do we have to start waiting for the other? No, we can do it in the So if you want to write stuff down, that's one more. Oh, if you want to cheat on the quiz, I don't care. My philosophy is you don't have to memorize everything. You have to know how to look up the food. Oh, yeah. Because there's no way you can remember every growing detail about a rebrush. That's all I feel like spend some on kids are. Oh, I'll <laughs> 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 
This is an easy one. Outside the trade of a So the great thing about it is. Be careful, though. There's a so started with two. Also, they get big. But, so they have the rich below them. They yeah. also have some support them as they grow out as help them. And even when we the the and I get that I'm like, I'm seeing it. Yeah. That's a way to do it. I'm going to go to the I have no idea. My cousin, the old boy, my neighbors from Wisconsin. I never I'm looking at soil blocks here. Mm. It's going to be soil blocks. Mm. Mm. Well, you'll have to let me know how that's work out. Be my first I'll year. Right here. Yes. I've done everything. It's kind of hard when you're here. Same kind of deal. I think. I mean, like everything is kind of doing most of the time. Yeah. Jerry's not here. 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 <laughs> yeah, in fact, I was going to have a very particular problem in the ground. It's all on the top of the first camera. Right off here, it's about the top of 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 the for in the 
and they brought in the fire. So you got plus on cold water pretty Yeah, once you get into my backyard about this far down, it's careful you can keep just keep it down. Right. So it's, yeah. so I, it's a lot of fertilizer. Whatever, whenever I'm going to get in there, because I didn't need the moisture, so I just, I mix probably those are fertilizer. Yeah, I'm She's got it right here. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Can I borrow that for just one second? Okay. Um, you need it? Well, they want to come. Well, I can send this to you electronically. My ambitious was here last year. That's all I did with the I just put them in a container and so really go for anything like that. So I did. Oh, that's pretty cool. I do have bags. Why? We're going to have one box at some point. I do have bags. 
But there's more little pods by the one means help yourselves to those. And Connor, you're welcome to help yourself to all this too. Nice. You drop a seed right into that plug. So do those plugs help with like the seeds that say they're not, they don't take transplant well? They can. They can. There's some seeds that just have to be right? I don't think so right now. Help yourself. I think we need to work on the bags, but if you want to spray, take a spray. And I don't know if you took enough seeds. Doesn't look like enough seeds. That's more than that. <laughs> we need double that. There's, there's still three of us that are starting to see. I was looking for stuff actually. So the 75 days, as long as it's able to from March, May 6th, they could hit 75. That's the goal, right? So it takes that plant home. I can do one at the finish, right? We want, we want them to be successful. But so that would require starting them to be soon. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 I gotta get my own party. Who was the lady that brought all those plants that we all split up? Was that Kathy? Kim Parker. Kim Parker. How can I? She had a lot of outdoor garden things, didn't she? I don't, how can I communicate with her? Send me an email to remind me that you want to talk to Kim Parker. Okay. Well, uh, I won't remember. It was the driest we have ever. Yeah, I got the and I was like, I don't know. So what do I What do you think of soil block? <laughs> so grab some of these. Just, just unless there's leftovers. Okay. And then there's a box right over there. The big box, and then put um, and then put the the plugs in there. Yeah. Okay. And then there's bags here. So, what's the plan for the plant? Yeah, and there everybody is advised to that. Where did you see the oil from? I ordered all this from Look how cute I was last year. Thinking I'd be able to fit all my seeds in there. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. That's pretty cool. Mine's not quite that organized, but I have I have a big refrigerator. It's just nothing but seeds on one side, and I got little cat food cups. Um, and I put seeds in there, and then I got a bigger tray for the seeds. And so I just took some seeds from my snapdragon. Well, those 
Do you think I can get some germination rates from them? Because I'm terrible about my garden hygiene and they were all in a barrel and I was watering my trees this week and I'm like, hey, what are their seeds in there? <laughs> there? There were seeds. Yeah, their little faces look so cute. Yeah, they could be okay. Well, I'm try it. A bunch of marigold suits too. I could die. Uh, yep. It'll be interesting to see if those will work well. Will mint come, come back if I left it outside all winter? Did you water it? Uh, I wanted it today because I just realized that I left it outside all, <laughs> all winter. <laughs> Why not? You know, normally I bring the pot into my garage, but I got distracted. <laughs> Yeah, that's all right. Let's say it like, <laughs> maybe what about like time? Was it left in a pot too, or is it in the soil? It's in the soil. It should be okay. Okay, I have time that's just lives just, on its own. It's time. Okay. If not, I think there are seeds over there. Okay. I haven't seen for like any sort of family thing. So my child, I got, I bought them because I couldn't to not grow them. So I bought it. Yeah. Now, like, do they count? <laughs> I don't know. Probably not. Okay. And soil blockers are okay. Or yeah, absolutely. Like, I, 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 want, I want it to be like side by side. So I put zucchini in a soil block and put it directly in the ground. But they both did horribly. So I don't know if they both did horribly. Okay. Well, I don't know. <laughs> 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 Did everybody get the wants one of these? Get one of these? So go ahead and take take some, take as many of those as you want. So take another thirty six of those. So PJ, did you want to take one of those? Yes. 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 You're my god, the little six of them. Oh, folks are over there. And I've got root seeds over here. I've got beets and carrots. Are these These are just take them and enjoy them in your own garden. Yeah. They don't try and plant them. They're not transplanted at all. Yeah, we take some instruction we need for this. Stick your sword, season, don't never let it dry out. Does it want to eat up? There we go. Now that is funny. <laughs> that is funny. But thank you. Why? That's a recent record, tell you. Yeah, yeah, but it still says the same thing. Okay. Can you move these? By all means, move yourselves to these. Depends on your termination rates. So you might want to find another one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I just think I could say another I got I got I Somebody told me that he was a master gardener. That's what I'm going to find out later that they have. You need more. It's kind of a little bit of a connection for you. You know, lady, you said, Sunny used to be and has probably passed Mary Harrington. They used to work with me at Lowe's. She went to the store without working out the nursery. That's great. All right. Yeah. I think it's his wife, Adri, that told me that he was a mastery gardener the other day because I told her I'm taking a mastery gardener. Yeah, I have the, the one that stands out the most for me. Her name was Robin, and she came up to me about halfway through the class and said, You know, I'm on cancer treatment. And, and so I might miss a few classes. And I said, That's okay. No problem. She managed to take all the classes, finish the test. Got all the 40 hours in. Graduation was in October, and two months later, she passed. So I thought that was pretty cool that she did it. Yeah, she hung in there and she did it. But I've had probably eight people that I am aware of take the class as kind of their bucket list last thing they wanted to do. At the end of the summer, I'll invite you out there and you can see the Dave. Yeah, I'd like to see Dave Johansson Memorial Garden. It's got a little plaque out there. It's pretty cool. It's, uh, people, it's kind of it's funded by generous people that want to keep his memory alive because he is out there all the time just doing it on his own. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like have you ever been up to the um, Unitarian Church? That was that whole garden was managed by one woman. It's huge. And that's that's what she did in her retirement. And that's that's what kept her alive as long as it did. Was that, that garden Where is the Unitarian Church? I'm clueless. And is the garden still there? Part of the garden is still there, not all of it. Um, it's over by the Greek Orthodox Church, but just a little bit to the north of it. Oh, downtown? Yeah, that helps. Yeah, yeah, so you can see Yeah. 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 I mean, I could, I could take I know it. where it is. Yeah. I know where it is. Okay. Like said, Saints Concert. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> they almost assigned me there, but they didn't. So. Not enough room to garden there. No room to garden at all. There. Yeah. I've walked the, the parking garden. lot, maybe. I, I've walked the grounds there with, with someone a long time ago to look at the trees and everything. And oh, there's yeah. not enough room there to garden. <laughs> I think they own the lot out back. Yeah. Which would be cool, but. 
We've got five acres. A good size part of the five acres is too much. Too much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've got we've just got to get our seven beds working a little better. And, yeah. Yeah. I just see 